guess the explanation is that uh, under time duress, someone phones up and says, what's the title of your talk? I just couldn't think of anything, Maisons and Baryons. And now I'll, I'll explain my change of mind later, or right, rather shortly. Um, <coughs> I was, was going to start out with a fable or a bad dream that I thought of in terms of Maisons and Baryons, which is, takes you back to Schrodinger and his equation whereby he wrote down the equation as I saw it and then was embarrassed to find he couldn't solve the equation. But worse than that, none of his colleagues nor anybody else could do it. But came a comforting person with a, <coughs> with a futuristic point of view. Patience, in 80 years we'll have a hyper, super, cyber computer which will solve your equation, and you will get the binding energy of the hydrogen atom. Why is, that, why is that a story? Because that's a way we're caught, in a way, in terms of QCD, in the non-perturbative case. So I have a tendency to move away from mesons and baryons. And then also, in terms of making, of cutting down a 30-minute talk on 40 or 6 years to manageable proportions, I looked for another theme. And I found it. And you'll see that, as a matter of fact, it's naturally taken. And that is, it's photons, both real and virtual, and time-like and space-like. Dirk actually went through the rationale, in fact, more detail than I had planned to, as to why photons are so important, because we think we understand them. And then the other part of it is because they're flavor-free. That is to say, they, they will latch on to anything with a charge, and they don't care. Provided that you have the energy to provide the mass, they don't care what flavor you are, what family you are, anything like that. <coughs> now, of course, the, the prime illustration of the beauty of, of photons is also taken up in other talks at, uh, this, at these sessions today and this, after, this morning and this afternoon, namely the Friedman, Kendall, Taylor experiments at SLAC and MIT, which of course make use of the space-like photon and in fact uh, condemn those of us who are working on meson baryon to realize that we weren't dealing with elementary particles, but we're dealing with molecular chemistry, if you please. And then also in the time-like region, the experiments that I'm sure Sam will cover, both the uh, first experiments on the production of vector mesons at DAISY, and then following the E plus E minus experiments. So that eliminates part of my problems. And now I'll go, and I want to do, I want to essentially do a chronology of some of the things that have happened in the laboratory, both emphasizing mostly the physics, but occasionally putting a little twist on it in terms of nostalgia and whatnot. And a, there's also an apology to the younger members of this audience, who probably it's difficult to conceive of why we were perplexed by a certain point at a certain time when the answer was so obvious. Well, I can only tell you that it wasn't obvious at the time. One of the first experiments, actually, Fred alluded to, and this is the pho using photons to produce, in, in this case, pi zero mesons. And, and uh, this was, in fact, one, one of the first experiment that was done at the 300 MeV synchrotron here at MIT, essentially confirmed what you could do by geometry namely that they were dealing mostly with a j equal 3 halves resonance and that also that there's an S wave production of pi zeros at that time somewhat mysterious. There was another thing that's now was obvious but it, it, I know it led to uh, some controversy at the time is uh, that uh, is the coherent production of pi zeros from nuclei which uh, sounds like perfectly reasonable quantum mechanics, leaving the nucleus in the ground state. But at that time was controversial because, yes, everybody knew about elastic scattering of things doing, going coherently, but producing pi zeros seemed to be another thing. But here was the experiment 
then uh, Gil Davidson's thesis on producing pi zeros. And you'll notice as you go to heavier and heavier nuclei that the production peaks for forward more and more. Just a fun thing. Here's a combination of illustrating what will become part of my thesis, if you please. Namely, we were producing, we were producing both physics and we were also producing physicists. So I label some of these things with the people's, uh, whoever was thesis. And here's Bert Richter's thesis, where the interest there was the expected, the expected, let me do it this way, the expected from what you would expect from the three halves resonance, but on top of that, a very, actually very conventional, simple photoelectric effect for producing a pi plus meson. And, and is evidenced here by the interference term between the two. All of this was very, <coughs> very, very new. Now, there's an, it was an experiment that was uh, done, and we called it then four Daves and a Bob. The four Daves being uh, Dave, Dave Caldwell, Dave Frisch, Dave Hill, Dave Ritson, and Bob Schluter being the Bob. And there, uh, this again is history. Up to that time, there'd been some measurements of pi proton scattering in this energy range that had sort of made a mush out of this thing. There was some, a bump there, but it was not very clear. And uh, here, they did a very careful job and saw that these were the two, and in fact, those are the next two, I equal, T equal one and a half resonances in the pion nucleon system. I added Frank Geno Genovese's name to this because it was Frank who, uh, with me, he, we were making a differential Cherenkov counter, and it was he who pointed out to me because he was, and this was part of this experiment, it was he who pointed out to me that a beam of particles going through, uh, producing Cherenkov light gives light that looks like a ring of stars. And he said, you know what we ought to do? Put a lens in front of it and, and look at the focal, focal plane, and you'll see a ring which will depend upon the velocity of the particles. Cute. That's an undergraduate student. OK. Now, moving on. And here's some bubble chamber work. And now you probably, I should have outlined here, but I want to emphasize, of course, the, <coughs> and now even I can't see it, <coughs> but uh, is the contributions from the MIT, and you'll recognize the names of Rosenson and Yamamoto and Pless, who were, of course, still with us, but Yamamoto at that time was a graduate student. And this, what was this experiment was in a bubble chamber and was the production of eta zeros, but the most important thing there was it was a mystery still. The eta zero had been found, but there were neutral, a neutral decay that was unexplained, that is to say, couldn't be found. And it was they who found that the eta zero decayed into two gammas, which was rather extraordinary because it was competing with the three pi decay, which is a strong interaction. And of course, the reason behind that was the violation of G parity, which was prohibiting the three pi decay of the eta zero. So it was unraveled a mystery at that time. Uh, then continuing on, and now uh, to the um, work done at the Cambridge Electron Accelerator. And here is Baris V. Baryam's thesis, where uh, one of the outputs of that was the discovery of a resonance by looking at uh, high Q square, high momentum transfer photo pi zero production here. And in fact, this is the, the uh, I, I equals the isotopic spin three halves the highest baryonic resonance, I think, still extant. And one of the amusing things is if you do a fruit, uh, chew Frouchy plot with these things, is that all those resonances fall on a nice straight line if you plot J versus M squared, which seems extraordinarily simple and goes back to my comments about QCD and my prejudice that somehow the molecular physics of uh, quarks may turn out to be simpler than at least would be indicated by the computers that have been brought to bear on that problem. Okay. <clears throat>
then next was um, also an amusing byproduct of, um, of the experiments we did in producing photo, pi zero and pi plus photo production. And here, for, just for amusement, we took the ratio of the photo production cross sections to the pi scattering, single pi scattering cross sections. And we discovered that even over a very large range of cross sections, that is from small forward angle cross sections to backward, these points all centered about a ratio of 0.85, i.e. roughly 2 pi over alpha. Well, that was just thrown out as an amusing thing, but also clearly the implication of it was that the photon is acting very much like a strongly interacting particle, simply with a reduced coupling. And indeed, I believe this was part of the inspiration for Sakurai to invent the vector dominance model. <coughs> so uh, continuing with that and continuing on vector dominance, here's another bubble chamber. Again, this was the, called the Cambridge Bubble Chamber Group. And again, the names Plass, Rosenson, and Yamamoto. And of course, this, this typical of bubble chambers, you don't get many events, but what you get are fairly clear. And that is a bump where the row zero should be, a production cross section indicating the threshold for it. And the important thing was that indeed, confirming the vector dominance model, a gamma, the cross section for conversion of gamma rays to rows was very large. In other words, easy to do. Now, then, uh, because CEA didn't really have the energy, it was a prejudice, I guess it was a prejudice of mine, that there was something smelled wrong with the Reggie. Uh, some of you don't have, haven't had the benefit of education in the Reggie, in Reggie models, but they were supposed to be at one time a nice explanation or at least a parameterization at worst and possibly even included some physics. And uh, it was our feeling that uh, it was a little bit artificial. And we, here was an experiment where we thought we'd test it rather severely because we manufactured um, polarized photons with a crystal and, and then measured uh, pi plus photo production with polarized photons. And this is the asymmetry between one polarization and the other. That's the severest test you can put a model to when you start taking account the spins of the photon and the polarizations. And indeed, we are gratified to be able to eliminate at least two models. And I think this third model was, had so many parameters in it that it sort of sunk on its own, under its own weight. So in point of fact, I hope we help to bury the Reggie theory. Oh, I should say, by the way, that, that and here's an aside, that um, this was also the occasion of the, what we call the, the perfect diamond caper. The, to produce the polarized photons required a perfect crystal. And we'd been disappointed by the, the presumed suppliers who were presuming a br brilliant crystal. And so we had everything going, including a very elaborate goniometer. We had everything ready to go. We even had the experiment was all planned out and scheduled. There was only one thing missing. We didn't have the perfect crystal. And so uh, we uh, phoned, among others, we phoned, of course, De Beers. We phoned a Rutherford lab. We phoned various solid state laboratories. We, f um, we phoned the Aga Khan's Diamond Laboratory in India, all looking for a perfect crystal. And we did get from Johns Hopkins, we found a man who had a crystal, the cor one corner of which, one millimeter, uh, was in fact perfect. Well, with that inspired that nature could do such a thing, I went and got a hold of Harry Winston, who runs a diamond a jewelry store in, on Fifth Avenue in New York, very elegant. His son had been in the Rocket Society at MIT, and indeed, he let me th run through all the crystals. I found a lovely four-carat crystal, 
and it turned out, and measuring it on the outside, it was superb. And we cut it up, and sure enough, it was perfect. Not quite, but I won't go into that. In any event, <coughs> now I'm going over into time like photons as opposed to real. And I want to remind something that Martin, Mench, Martin Deut mentioned, but I would like to restate. Namely, if you're the, one of the first E plus E minus, if you please, experiments was done by Martin. <coughs> and he, in fact, in this was the experimental apparatus here, where the uh, positrons went into a gas, and then the photons were detect detected here. But the important point, here's one of the results, which was published in 51. This is the drop-off in counts due to the lifetime of the triplet state. And then the clever thing that Martin had done was to show that he could get rid of the triplet state by adding gases which would convert triplet to singlet and therefore get rid of some of the counts that he was getting from the triplet state. And so there, indeed, was the first, if you please, E plus E minus uh, annihilation experiment. Now, um, the blaze of uh, inglory, or glory, whichever you want to think, of uh, CEA was the last experiment done in terms of the storage ring there, uh, which, of course, unfortunately lacked luminosity and therefore was shut down. Here's Harvey Newman's thesis showing that the E plus E minus scattering was perfectly good and classical, as it should be, but a rather strange result, or rather unexpected result, was that the ratio of hadron production to muon pair production was much larger than expected by the quark theories extant at that time, and in fact had risen to much larger values. The fact of the matter is the points here from Joe's thesis uh, had shown this before, in fact, Slack got on the air. But Joe, being polite, or urged probably by me, since the results were out when he did the thesis, put in the later Slack results into his thesis, which confirmed it. Now I turn back to uh, space-like photons, <coughs> where we did an experiment at SLAC, um, uh, which was probably one of the first, at least the first, with a reasonable amount of hadronic results, of looking at the hadronic final state in deep and elastic electron scattering. And uh, I'll only quote, show you one result, well, no, two results. But one was by looking at the state and just simply saying, making very simple assumptions, like isotopic spin invariance, you could measure from the hadronic charge ratios in a rather complex way, which I won't go into, something that should give you the absolute value of the up quark charge to the down quark charge. Now, you might say, I thought everybody knew that. Well, no, not everybody knew that. In fact, it wasn't too clear that there were quarks. You have to put you in that mindset in order to appreciate some of the silly things we did at that time. And so, of course, you get, as you sh you got, we got, as you should, a factor of two. That is, in retrospect. <coughs> Another result of that experiment was simply looking at the plus to minus ratio and comparing it in a funny way with what you, we got, what was available from neutrinos. That is to say, once a quark has emitted a positive, a leading positive meson, it presumably leaves the leading quark in the down state, in which case you would expect to get a minus meson as the leading quark. Or you would expect to get the same thing you get from a neutrino experiment. OK, so we looked at that. And indeed, here are the neutrino points. And then here's the, plus, the minus to plus ratio for the uh, for the mesons coming off that thing. And indeed, that was pretty, it was nice. By the way, that line, uh, people who know me know that, that I always lapse into a mood of having, explaining a hadron, hadronization model of my own. And, uh, and this line is the prediction for that ratio. <coughs> 
I, I gave it originally, the history of that, I gave it originally as a, a homework problem in 805, the quantum mechanics course, because it's very easy to do, okay? And so this is what you get out of an 805 explanation for hadronization. Works very nicely, by the way. Oh, and it's the granddaddy of those models. It came before Feynman Field and, uh, and clearly before Lund. Now, Viet Busha, and now I depart and I make an exception. This is not about photons. <coughs> Viet Busha had a nice idea about hadronization. He said, you should be able to find out about hadronization if you look at how it occurs in nuclear material. That is to say, the nuclear medium, somehow you expect, will affect it, and that should reveal something about the hadronization mechanism. And in fact, here's an, a nice, ex, a simple experiment done at Fermi Lab by Boucher and uh, other colleagues in the counter spark chamber group. And you see that the end result was as follows that if you look at the forward going particles, this is plotted versus rapidity, that you cannot very readily distinguish the the difference between the forward, the, um, both the number and the distribution of the high rapidity particles. <coughs> Indicating, therefore, that in some sense, the hadronization must be taking place outside the nuclear material since it seems to be unaffected by it. And now, and that actually, for the time being, and possibly more, created an industry in the use of nuclei and production of nuclei, both as an indication of the hadronization process, but also, as we shall see, um, uh, an indication of how the quark itself interacts with nuclear material. Well, actually, you won't see, because I don't have any material on that. We did the same thing at that same with electroproduction on nuclei. And all I can say about that, because this is a little bit too complicated, but essentially these are different elements and the distribution in momentum and the distribution in P perp. And a way of summarizing that result is that, in point of fact, in the same way that was found in the nuclear material at the Fermilab experiment, you cannot distinguish a jet that has been produced in lead or nuclei of heavy nuclei from a, the jet of hadrons produced in deuterium. Again, indicating that the hadronization takes place outside. What's the time here? OK. <coughs> Long ago, it was, um, it was found that photons and again, because of the vector dominance, a photon is frequently a row. And we'll hear more about that. And therefore, when you bombard nuclei with photons, you find indeed that uh, they, there is what's called a shadowing, namely the photon on lead does not look like photons times 208 nucleons, but is less. And here's an experiment which we've just finished at E6. E665 at Fermilab, indicating the same thing. That is to say, here it's done with deep and elastic scattering from muons. And you see that it's, the ratio is around 1 here. As you go to, to small x, find xbj, indeed, finally, the numbers of shadowing from virtual photons begins to agree at very small x with what you get from photons. All right. And now, I shift. In praise of gluons, virtual and real, whatever that means with respect to gluons. And why praise of? Well, here's a transparency of um, something that Fred Epling showed, namely the gem detector for the super collider, and it was by way of an introduction to the fact that having told you something of the past, let me tell you a little about the present. And of course, the, as the, the, the uh, 
the challenge here is for you to find the person in this picture. <clears throat> so uh, let me say that we're coming along. The first chain we have built, we, uh, our group is primarily interested in doing the muon part of the chambers for that experiment. We've started on that. And indeed, we have just made and are about to test one chamber, which is of, of a reason, but uh, approximately the kind of lengths we talk about in making, except that we'll have to make something like 900 of these. And this is the first test. And the, and the data reduction panel here for such a thing. But then, that's pretty far in advance. So what to, how to amuse ourselves in the meantime? Well, we do have um, various projects, both CDF and uh, the, the Gran Sasso project and so on. And I'm clearly, by the way, for the time being, I'm, I, I'm letting Sam is going to take care of himself. So I'm talking about, um, I'm not covering the Kendall Friedman experiments or the, the, all the nice work that uh, the Sam Ting group has done. But in the meantime, here with uh, Veet Boucher, Steve Stedman, Bernie Wadsworth, and whatnot, have um, put in a letter of intent for an experiment at Rick. And that thing is busily going along and expects to be running sometime in 97. And let's see, and to punctuate, if you notice that uh, one of the implications of the uh, transparencies I was showing was that we were not only producing physics, but we were producing physicists. Yes, even laboratory directors. And so it's rather topical that I present as the last uh, something to do with Kobe, namely the hero of that particular result was George Smoot. And George Smoot was one of Dave Fritch's uh, students, PhD students. <coughs> and I have, I'd like to say that the reason George saw, saw the light was by virtue of his great training under Dave's uh, leadership. By the way, this is not to be confused, as I was for a while, with those of you who live around here, it is not to be confused with the smoot, which is a unit of measurement for the Massachusetts Avenue Bridge and refers to an Oliver Smoot, who was apparently very stiff enough one evening to have been used as a measuring stick. So I'll, I'll end on that note.